Andy Joseph was a student of mine uh, at MIT in the late uh, so late 1980s, right. and uh, he he worked on uh, microwave mm -hmm. scattering from the ocean surface. In particular, uh, we were interested in whether uh, you could quantify the incidence of breaking, uh, looking at um, the so-called sea spikes uh, in radar, and uh, that was a that was a topic of of Andy's uh, research. In the, the latter stages of that, I think he was smart enough to realize that uh, actually doing more specific imaging of the ocean surface would be a better way of looking at these problems. And was among the first, I think, to introduce um, infrared remote sensing of the uh, of the ocean surface. Certainly, uh, I'm sure the military were doing a lot of this, but uh, Andy was, Andy really introduced or reintroduced the topic uh, to the field uh, in the, uh, you know, starting in the, in the 90s. And uh, he's gone on to, uh, you know, continue to be a leader uh, in that field, looking at the ocean surface and the lower atmosphere and upper ocean. So, uh, and been very successful in, in, in uh, that, that sort of research. So uh, again, I'm very happy to have Andy here uh, and look forward to hearing about what he's going to talk about. Well, thank you, Ken, for that kind introduction. And uh, it's an honor to, to uh, be included in such a distinguished group speakers and I want to thank the organizers Luke and Fabrice and Nick for inviting me. When uh, Fabrice contacted me about your 70th birthday, it made me somehow remember that uh, I re recall your 40th birthday. And one of the things I remembered about that was um, that you got a new Saab automobile for your, as a present. I thought, well, why did I remember that? It's funny we'll remember these things. Ben. And I realized it was shortly after that that you sold me your old VW Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Liberty, <laughs> after some uh, Peter Rabbit bunny that was Liberty. And, uh, and you failed to tell me that it had these um, uh, slight problem of, of not wanting to start again after it had been running for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I commuted with that back and forth to Providence for a year and then it ended up in a junkyard. You know, it was whole thing. <laughs> but uh, and it, that sort of prompted a bunch of memories that I. Uh, I, uh, you saw this picture yesterday, but I thought it'd be fun to show it again. This is about 1987. So it's uh, hard to believe it's really been 30 years, over 30 years, when I wandered into your office looking for a position in oceanography. I'd actually come to MIT um, to pursue a, a degree in medical engineering and medical physics in the mechanical engineering department with Roger Cam. Uh, it only took me about one semester to realize that that wasn't a very good fit because I had no background in biology, and I learned that uh, the fastest anybody had finished that program was seven years. Uh, so I ended up in Ken's office, and uh, at that time you were just starting to think about microwave remote sensing of breaking waves, and that sounded um, interesting enough to me, and it, we made an agreement. And, and then it wasn't shortly, shortly after that I started to wonder if I, uh, what I got myself into when you uh, were scrutinizing my fluids class from course two, mechanical engineering, to uh, see whether or not it was advanced enough to be equivalent to your fluids class in course one that, that I didn't take. And um, this was uh, even though the um, instructor had been uh, none other than Asher Shapiro himself. Uh, and so I was a little bit behind uh, those first uh, year with my peers having missed the first semester. And, struggled through uh, Chang's Waves class and uh, made it through the qualifying exam and I remember making the mistake of asking Ola how I had done in the qualifying exam and he, in his inimitable fashion answered, you passed by the skin of your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I realized that Ken had probably had to use his power, great, great powers of persuasion to get me over that hurdle. Uh, but that really wasn't the most challenging part of my, my career. The, challenge, the most challenging part was really finding a radar to do my research because we, can, we hadn't done anything with radar. And, and uh, you may remember that we ended up uh, delving into the um, center of the universe of the police radar business in Wichita, Kansas. I went out to Wichita and found a radar engineer who said he would build us a radar and, 
and he built the radar and it was delivered and then we realized he was probably more like a used car salesman than a railroad <laughs> radar engineer because it looked like a Rube Goldberg contraption by the time we got it set up. So I don't think we ever paid him for that. But as a consolation, he had uh, given me a old used police radar, which turned out to be good enough to uh, end up as a publication in nature. Uh, so that worked out okay, but we were still looking for a radar and we ended up driving in that new Saab to UMass Amherst to meet with Bob McIntosh to see if he could build us a radar. And the, the price of the radar to support one of their master's students was not to your liking. And I think we even tried to get an equipment grant from uh, Hewitt Packard, and that didn't go very far either. So, of course, we ended up uh, with a great collaboration with Bill Keller at the Naval Research Lab, um, which was both enjoyable and very fruitful. And um, so that's how I got my radar. Um, and then I also recall that. Um, uh, the Saxon CLT experiment, where I did my thesis work on the Chesapeake Light Tower, I think was probably one of your first forays into field work. And uh, we uh, deployed a pretty impressive array of equipment there. We did the meteorological measurements and the wave measurements for the entire group and deployed two radars, one for my work and one for your um, first EM bias, electromagnetic bias study. Uh, and I remember Ken uh, didn't really want to pay for the shipping of the equipment from uh, Cambridge to Norfolk. So I said, well, we could rent a truck and drive it down. So it was myself and some other fellow intrepid graduate students driving an oversized truck that uh, didn't seem to, he barely, seemed to barely fit through the Lincoln Tunnel on our way from Boston. <laughs> so, um, so I guess my point is there's a lot of great memories. And um, one of the things, though, about that experiment was that Bill, or, uh, Ken did give me a lot of responsibility and independence in um, fielding that project, and uh, it was a great way to cut my teeth on a major field experiment, so, so I really appreciate that. Um, so I could go on, but uh, uh, let's suffice it to say there are uh, lots of fond memories of um, uh, that formative time uh, with Ken at uh, my teeth. So in any case, um, uh, to move on to the topic of my talk today, oh, the other thing though, you can imagine I feel a little bit of trepidation. I feel a little bit of trepidation here. It's basically a reunion of my qualifying exam committee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to tell you about a, an area that I've, I've tried to come back to uh, wave breaking and infrared remote sensing recently uh, to um, uh, see what we can learn about uh, wave breaking by um, exploiting the cooling foam signature, well, the infrared signature of cooling white cap foam and its relationship to wave uh, dissipation. So what I want to do is lead you through um, uh, uh, some old, uh, take some old measurements which, um, uh, where we looked at the uh, phenomena of um, the disruption of the cool skin layer by a breaking wave re uh, producing a warm wake in the, in the wake of the breaking. And uh, combine that with some more recent measurements. Uh, um, showing that uh, we often see a cool signature of foam, the residual, residual foam that appears after the wave breaks that can have a cooling signature. And I'm going to combine that into what I am calling a conceptual model for the infrared signature of breaking that goes from uh, the rise with the white cap, the decay of the um, uh, cool skin uh, recovery, um, and then um, cooling of the foam and recovery there. And I want to relate that to uh, some recent measurements of um, findings about the um, visible signature of foam, the lifetime of the visible signature of foam, and ultimately see if we can relate this to the plume decay time, which then can uh, tell us something about dissipation, uh, the dissipation rate. So for those of you who may not be familiar with um, infrared remote sensing of uh, the ARC interface, I briefly want to make a mention of the cool skin effect. Um, this occurs at any uh, air, sea inter air water interface, uh, it happens in your coffee cup if you have a net upward heat flux, a thermal boundary layer on the order of a millimeter or so, depending on the wind speed gets developed. And because turbulent motions are suppressed near the surface, we have uh, the, the heat flux through that boundary layer is supported primarily by conduction. And so we have a small temperature gradient between the bulk temperature below the thermal boundary layer and what we refer, refer to as the skin temperature. And that uh, temperature difference, the bulk skin temperature difference, is on the order of a few tenths of a degree in nature. And now that's important and relevant to infrared remote sensing because the optical depth of the infrared wavelengths that we use is about 10 microns. So when we make a thermal, an infrared measurement of the sea surface temperature, 
we're effectively measuring the skin temperature at an effective measurement depth of about 10 microns. So you can imagine if, a, if this is a quiescent state and then a wave, break, wave comes along and breaks that skin layer, you see warm water um, uh, mixed up from below and then that skin layer is going to recover at a rate that depends on the dissipation and also on uh, the heat flux, the net heat flux and the wind speed. So these were measurements that um, we reported on almost 20 years ago now, showing uh, this sequence of images on the visible on the left and the infrared on the right. Uh, the first three images, you see the white cap developing. You see a um, apparent increase in temperature here due to the change in the electromagnetic properties of the end scattering of the white cap itself because the bubbles have a different emissivity than the undisturbed water. But the interesting feature here is after the wave crest is passed, you see clear water here, but you see this warm wake um, where you have a few tenths of a degree increase in temperature from the floor when the wave passed. <clears throat> and so we looked at um, the time series, time evolution of this rise due to the white cap and then the decay of the warm wake. And we looked at that as a function of the phase speed of the waves and showed that the that skin layer recovery time scales with the phase speed of the wave, which can give you some indication of the scale of the breaking. So that's old, and more recently, more recent, uh, or after that, when we started using higher resolution and more sensitive infrared cameras, we noticed uh, this cooling residual foam phenomena. On the left is a visible image with a, a frame here that corresponds to the thermal image on the right. Um, and in this case, we use a grayscale, because your eye can see contrast better in the grayscale than in the color. Uh, dark is cool and light is warm. <coughs> And you can see, um, well, one of the things we noticed right away was there's often a momentary delay between the visible appearance of the foam and when the cooling starts. And so that's a clue uh, that, um, to what I'm going to talk about later on to try to put this all together. Uh, and then you also, we also noticed that not all residual foam appears cooled. For instance, these solid circles here, solid ovals show appearance of cooling foam, but then here's a situation here where we don't see any cooling. And in fact, cooling foam patterns evolve over time. Uh, there's some, uh, here's some examples of a couple of other research groups that have looked at this. Marino and Smith were the first to publish it in the peer-reviewed literature. This is an example of a large-scale image show and a blow-up then of the evolution in time of these cooling foam patches uh, becoming more cool. I think these are about a second apart. And then more recently, um, my grad student, Roxanne Carini, has used this um, as a method for differentiating white cap stages in the surf zone. And here's a nice example of another recent paper from the NRL group where they're using um, uh, visible and infrared to differentiate between uh, stage A, actively breaking, and the air entrainment stage, and stage B, which is referred to for the plume evolution and residual foam formation. So for instance, here's an active crest that appears bright in both. Here's the foam that is cooled and is residual. And here's a nice example of another breaking crest coming in that's actively breaking. And you can see now in the thermal, we can differentiate between those two much easier than you can in the visible. So this is all well and good. It's something that's been observed for um, 10 or 15 years. Uh, and um, uh, Marmarino and Smith suggested this was um, perhaps due to enhanced evaporative heat flux from the foam, which sounds reasonable. But we also know that the emissivity of foam is different than the emissivity of water. So we wanted to um, go into the laboratory and find out if we could understand the phenomena of the cooling foam itself before we then, then we move on to try to exploit it. So we did a uh, laboratory experiment in a wind wave flume at the University of Washington. Um, this is a uh, wind flume here. And we have embedded in it a uh, one meter by half meter tank of seawater. This is a diagram, this is a photograph. We instrument it with um, uh, meteorological sensors so that we can uh, measure the net heat flux, the different components of the heat flux and measure the, to get the net heat flux. And then we also had a, a, um, a temperature, a thermistor rate here to get the very near surface temperature so we could measure that gradient. Uh, we control the heat, uh, the water temperature as well as the air temperature and humidity. We used a permeable fizzy tube uh, to create our foam patch by forcing uh, compressed air through that that uh, resulted in a relatively uniform foam patch that we could control. Uh, so here are some example uh, measurements of the time series of uh, the, um, this near surface temperature rake uh, with measurements uh, five, 
they're mysteries in the first two centimeters, and then a deeper, two deeper ones at five centimeters and seven centimeters. On the left is the foam-free uh, water, and on the right is the foamy surface. Um, this is temperature as a function of time. These are uh, five or ten minute records. Um, so this is the surface here with the coolest temperature because we had a net upward heat flux. And you can see quite clearly from these the uh, big separation here in temperature. So we have a much larger vertical temperature gradient in the foam case than in the foam free case. And you can also see by the slope of the time series here, we have a much um, faster rate of cooling when the foam is present. Uh, those results are summarized here in an example temperature profiles. This is a photograph from the side of the foam. And um, uh, this then is a sample um, uh, temperature gradient uh, depth uh, down to about 8 centimeters as a function of temperature range here about a degree and a half. The red is the uh, clear water and the foam is in blue. And you can see that there's a significantly stronger temperature gradient uh, over the region where the foam is. So in order to quantify that in terms of the net heat flux or the heat flux components, we uh, did a heat flux budget uh, uh, in a control volume of the uh, wind tunnel. Um, and the significant <coughs> components are uh, the difference between the upstream and the downstream effective heat fluxes, which is really the sensible heat flux component. Uh, the net latent heat flux, which we measure, um, is, uh, which we derive from the wind speed and the um, water vapor content, and then the radiative heat flux. So those uh, measurements are summarized here, um, where I've plotted the heat flux components as a function of wind speed. And I, I failed to mention here when we set this up, we, we used a, a relatively small wind speed uh, between 1 and 3 meters per second because we needed a wind speed so that we could get a measurable heat flux, but we didn't want the wind speed to be so high that we would blow the foam out of the tank. So here we uh, plotted this as a function of wind speed. Um, there's not a real strong dependence. Uh, the pluses are the uh, advective, um, the net advective heat flux. The red, uh, green is the, um, uh, set the um, radiative heat flux. And then the open squares are the latent heat flux. And this is for the foam-free case and for the foam case. And you can see that in most situations, the latent heat flux is the uh, major component. But you can see that under the situation where you have foam, you have a much larger uh, latent heat flux uh, than in the foam-free case. And you can also see a, relative, a stronger um, wind speed dependence, even though we have a relatively small range of wind speeds. <coughs> so those results can be replotted um, in a summary diagram here. We're now in plotting the net heat flux. Um, in other words, <coughs> some of these components of, of the heat flux as a function of wind speed again. Now where the open circles are the um, uh, foam-free case and the um, solid squares are the foam case. And now we've color-coded the, uh, the data so as a function of relative humidity. And of course, as the relative humidity go down, goes down the net. Um, evaporative or latent heat flux increases. So I think that these measurements show pretty clearly that the um, phenomena of the cooling foam that we observe from breaking waves is um, primarily due to the increased latent heat flux um, due to the presence of the foam. But more interestingly, I think for this issue of how we can exploit that is what happens when we turn the foam generation off. And that's illustrated here in this time series where we've uh, plotted the infrared temperature, the temperature derived from the, the infrared measurements, so that's the skin temperature, uh, as a function of time. Um, and in this first part of the time series, the foam is being continuously generated. And we see these random fluctuations of a few tenths of a degree here. There's a data gap here for some reason. But this is all continuously generated foam. And then right at this point here, uh, at this peak, we turned off the foam generation. And you can see that the foam quickly cool, cools very rapidly, and it coo cools uh, by several tenths of a degree. Um, and then the foam starts to dissipate, and the temperature rises back up to the background temperature. So I think what's going on here is, is the picture that I envision is that you have this, as the foam, when the foam is being generated, you have, it supports this um, stronger temperature gradient that provides this uh, greater net upward heat 
And it's not until you turn off that phone generation that then the phone begins to cool. And so if we think about how this might be used to study wave breaking, if the wave breaks and it drives the bubbles down and the bubble plume starts rising, the bubble, the foam shouldn't start cooling until the bubble plume is done rising, until that generation source is gone. And so what that uh, suggests is that we can use the time scale of the uh, tau cool, the time scale from when the, of when the foam starts to cool from when the breaking begins as a measure of the time scale of the bubble plume. So that's sort of the, nu that's the nugget of uh, my talk here and this idea that I'm uh, interested in pursuing. So now let's go back to uh, the literature and talk a little bit, uh, try to relate this to uh, visible white cap coverage. And some of you are, you're no doubt, many of you are no doubt familiar with this plot. Um, uh, came out uh, 10 years ago, uh, um, collating uh, all the available white cap coverage uh, data uh, from that time. And uh, this plot immediately made me think of Ken. Because um, as those of you who know Ken, uh, if he uh, had, feels a certain disdain for um, uh, scientific um, parameter or measurement, he's not shy about uh, expressing that. And uh, when it, back in the late 80s, uh, white cap coverage was not something that would probably be very useful to quantify breaking, and partly that's because of this, um, this kind of three orders of magnitude of scattering that it historically So it's not without some irony that. Uh, if this paper publication had come five or ten years later, we would see Ken's name over here now uh, with uh, some of those measurements. And that's because I think we've had uh, significant advances in both the technology of, in, of visible imaging on the surface and also the techniques. And uh, more and more since this publication has occurred and, uh, with some of Ken's work with his later students, um, there's been a converging of techniques and to where uh, white cap coverage um, uh, is actually a, a useful parameter and is, is still being um, examined. However, there is still scatter there, and it's of interest to know what that, the reason for that scatter is. Um, <coughs> differences in techniques, those can have been um, addressed, uh, as I said, uh, quite recently. There can be differences in variation of breaker types, spilling breakers versus plunging breakers. But the uh, effect that I think um, that, that is relevant to this talk here and where there's been some, some significant progress made is the effect of surfactants on the visible decay time, this tau foam. And the measurements, recent measurements on that uh, were done here at Scripps by um, Callahan and colleagues uh, in the laboratory where they uh, did an experiment with a series of um, uh, focused packet breaking uh, and looked at the um, tau foam, the lifetime of the uh, visible foam uh, as a function of surfactant concentration using a camera from above uh, to look at the foam patches and then a camera from below or from the side to look at the uh, plume. So this example here is a nice illustration of the effect of uh, uh, surfactants on the visible signature of foam. On the top is the sequence uh, looking down uh, for the clean case and on the bottom is the sequence of the top view looking down uh, for a surfactant case. And in the middle here, this is the side view of the, of the bubble plume, and it, this is, could either be for the clean or the surfactant because they found that there was really no effect on the bubble plume of the surfactants. So if we start here on the left with the clean case and the dirty case, they look pretty much the same. Uh, and here they're looking about the same, but now we actually see as the plume starts to dissipate, we see somewhat more foam on the surface here, and that that foam persists. Uh, whereas in the clean case, when the bubble plume's gone, the foam's gone. But when the uh, water is dirty, they used a, um, Triton X100 as a surfactant, then the foam lingers. So the, the conclusion is that uh, the surfactants stabilize the foam and cause its lifetime to um, be extended. And their measurements were summarized in this scatter plot here, or this, uh, uh, this XY plot of the um, tau foam, the time of the visible signature of the foam to, to go away as a function of the plume decay time. Uh, and you can see quite clearly that the open circles here, which are for the surfactant-free water, show a very nice one-to-one -one line here. 
and this is with increasing uh, wave slope, which uh, uh, correlates with increasing braking. Uh, so for the clean case, they found that tau foam was comparable to tau plume. Uh, that tau plume correlates with the dissipation, and this, of course, is consistent with early work from Ken and um, Eric Lamar uh, on the volume of the bubble plume being uh, correlated with the dissipation. <coughs> now, for the um, surfactant cases, which are the, um, the solid symbols here, they found uh, clearly that the, the decay time of the foam was much greater than the decay time of the and so in order to use the visible signature of the decay time of the foam as a measure of the plume, you need to account for this surfactant effect. And Callahan and colleagues are, um, have some clever ideas about that, and they've made some good progress on that. But uh, putting these results together with this our understanding now of the um, cooling foam, I think we are ready to um, attempt uh, some um, uh, conceptual model of the time history of an infrared uh, measurement of the skin temperature as a breaker passes a point on the surface. Um, so um, this Eulerian or 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 view here is just a um, uh, uh, convenience here for a conceptual model, but of course with um, uh, modern image processing techniques we can threshold the um, cooling foam and, and follow it. But I'm, here I'm just going to give a simple idea of if we have a, a square area on the water surface, uh, what happens to the skin temperature as a breaking wave passes through that point. So I'm applying temperature on the vertical, time on the horizontal, and we start out with some baseline here, which is the background skin temperature. So as the breaking crest enters the box, uh, the, the, the temperature, the skin temperature will, will rise because of the um, enhanced uh, scattering and emission from the white cap itself. And then as the, um, uh, we start to get the white cap passes out of the box, we're in the uh, region of the warm wake where we've disturbed the skin layer, and it's going to start to recover. And that recovery time, as it comes down to the baseline, uh, is going to be um, the skin layer recovery time. Um, and then as the wave continues to pass through, you can just start to see a little bit of the cooling foam coming in behind it here. And the wave passes on, and we have this nice patch of cooling foam. And now the, the, the infrared temperature drops down below, and then it comes back up to the baseline after the um, cooling foam um, dissipates. So um, in, the, uh, in terms of the visible signature, this time from, uh, from when we start to break to when the foam goes away would be this visible time scale, time scale of the tau foam of the visible signature. But as Callahan and colleagues showed, that um, uh, time for the, re for the disappearance of the foam can vary as a function of surfactant concentration. And as we march, as th that time gets shorter and shorter, that's getting closer and closer to what would be the clean um, tau foam for a clean case. So at some point, uh, I would uh, argue that this would be the um, clean case uh, what would be the equivalent recover, um, tau foam <coughs> in the visible for the clean case, which then would correspond to uh, the end of the bubble uh, generation um, of the plume. And then that, of course, I think would um, correspond to, the, to this tau cool, the time from breaking to when we first start to see the uh, cooling of the foam. So my contention is that the time this tau cool is, uh, can be used as a proxy for the uh, what would be the clean uh, uh, decay. Give you a measure of the decay plant time of the plume. So, uh, with this idea, we went back and looked at some of our archival data for examples. Uh, this is uh, both in the near shore and in the open ocean. Here's an example from the near shore. Uh, this is the one I used in the cartoon. Uh, where we see a very nice, cool patch of foam, and indeed the uh, time series looks similar to the conceptual model. It rises up, it cools down, and, and the warm wave recovers, and then we see a cooling and a recovery back to the case. Um, here's another example from the open ocean, uh, very different conditions, a large, a significant wave height and wind speed. The imager here was not quite as sensitive as the one in the previous example, but we see a very similar rise and then a decay and a cooling. So we don't have enough data to really do a, a, a quantitative um, 
survey, but we have uh, several dozen cases uh, showing that this is uh, at perhaps holds some promise. But the question here, the key question really is, is there any dependent on surfactants of this tau cooling uh, that is similar to the dependence that we found on the visible suit, that was found in the visible signature. So again, this, this is our cartoon. Uh, here I've shown how the visible signature of the foam can depend on the surfactant concentration. Does this tau foam, a tau cool foam from uh, in the infrared depend on surfactants? Well, I would argue, and I have argued that um, there's no reason why we should think that the onset of the cooling of the foam should depend on surfactants. There's certainly no uh, evidence in the literature that we could find. Um, and you can imagine that the rate of cooling might depend on surfactants. Um, but I don't think we have a real good reason to think that the onset of the cooling would depend on surfactants. But that argument apparently wasn't good enough for my, um, uh, for NSF in the first round of the review of the proposal that I submitted. Uh, and they wanted some additional evidence. So we went back into the laboratory and we did a, um, a simple uh, test to look at the effect of surfactants on this uh, tau cool. And we did a simple tipping, tipping bucket experiment, uh, somewhat along the lines of Callahan and company where using a, a visible and infrared imagers from the top and a, a visible imager from the side, but in a small tank with a tipping bucket rather than a, um, a full-blown uh, lab experiment with programmable breaking waves. <coughs> We, had a, um, we used clean and surfactant concentration uh, cases. We looked at three different uh, concentrations of um, Triton X100. We had a wind speed of about a meter per second. Here's a, some example snapshots of the visible imagery looking down and the infrared imagery looking down. This is a half a second after breaking. This is um, 1.7 seconds after breaking, and this is 3.5 seconds after breaking. Uh, the light, I apologize for the lighting here in this example, but you can see there's some foam here in the visible, but we don't see any signature in the infrared because the bubble plume is still rising. And so the foam is being generated, but it hasn't been allowed to cool yet because it is still being, uh, the, foam, the bubble is still being generated from below. And then after 1.7 seconds, you start to see the bubbles cooling, and in this case here, after three and a half seconds, you can see that most of the foam is cool. So the results of this exercise are uh, summarized in these time series plots, uh, and I'll, I'll take a moment to go through each one of them. Uh, we've plotted as a function of time, uh, about 10 seconds here, the cases for the clean and blue, and then uh, the different colors here are different degrees of concentration of the surfactant. The top plot is the um, normalized visible surface foam intensity. So this is the brightness of in the visible looking down at the top. The second one is the normalized visible bubble plume intensity. So that's the intensity uh, from uh, the side uh, telling you what, where the bubble plume is. And then these two are the same quantity. Here is the, uh, the temperature difference and the skin temperature between the foam and the undisturbed water. And then we've just normalized this here by the peak so we can look at the alignment in time. So looking first at the uh, intensity uh, of the visible foam, you can see that the blue, they, everything rises up here, so we align them with the first rise of the uh, signal. And you can see that the blue, which is the clean case, uh, decays more rapidly than all of the other um, um, surfactant cases, and that the surfactant cases pretty much all line up on top of each other. And that result is consistent with Callahan et al.'s findings, where they found that the, um, uh, the foam went away more rapidly when the water was clean than when it was dirty. Um, on the second plot now, um, the, the bubble plume intensity, you can see that although it's rather noisy here, they all pretty much lie on top of each other. You, you can't really distinguish the clean case from the dirty case, which again is consistent with Callahan et al.'s findings where the characteristics of the bubble plume do not change as a function of that. Now, if we look at the skin temperature measurements, uh, the, the, there is again a separation of the uh, clean case. Uh, they all rise up and then they, they decay, but the clean case decays back to the background temperature without showing any cooling, which is consistent with um, uh, the notion that um, once the foam goes away, if it's clean, uh, the foam goes away if it's clean after the bubbles are there, are stopped being generated, so there's no time for the, for the foam to cool. 
Whereas with the clean, the dirty cases, you can see that they all rise up and they start cooling here. And um, I've normalized them here by the peak so that you can see that effectively they all start cooling at the same time, regardless of the surfactant concentration. So I think this is um, reasonable evidence that it's not um, unreasonable to think that the, uh, school, the cool skin, that the tau cool uh, is not a strong function of surfactants. Another interesting feature of this here, I think, is that you can see, uh, we've plotted the dashed lines here to get an indication of the slope of these uh, lines, which corresponds to the, um, the cooling rate. And there is a, some indication that there's a, a dependence of the cooling rate of the foam on the surfactant concentration. So that's summarized here, and these are uh, preliminary results and not a lot of data points, but this is the clean case. I'm plotting the foam cooling rate as a function of the surfactant concentration. This is the clean case, and then you can see with the different concentration, there's a change in the rate of cooling. So there's some indication here that perhaps the uh, cooling rate, uh, even though tau cool is not affected by the surfactants, the rate of cooling may provide us with some indication of the surfactant concentration. So, uh, in summary, uh, we've investigated the cooling foam in the wakes of breaking waves and uh, shown that there's an increased latent heat flux due to the foam and that uh, we found a rapid cooling when the foam generation, generation ceases. So that led to uh, this uh, notion of a conceptual model for the infrared signature of breaking waves that incorporates the warm wake due to the skin layer disruption and the cooling residual foam um, in uh, I contend that um, uh, the proposition is that we can use the time from when the breaking starts to when we start to keep, see the cool foam as a proxy for the uh, plume decay time, which has implications for wave dissipation. Um, the cool, and so I think also that we could turn this around to say if you have an infrared camera and you're looking at the ocean surface and breaking and you see cooling foam, that tells you that you have surfactant surfactant effects there that you don't have clean water and, um, and, and so there's also been the potential for this cooling rate to provide a measure of surfactant concentration. So where are we on this? Um, well I've resubmitted my NSF proposal with these new measurements and that proposal is uh, being um, uh, in review now and we hope to um, uh, make measurements, uh, part of the proposal is to make measurements in a new facility we have here at the University of Washington which some of you may uh, be familiar with um, as the NASERF, the NASA Air Sea Interaction Research Facility, which is at Wall was was at Wallops Island, Virginia. Uh, here's a picture of it, circa 1998, and that's Mark Lowen in his swim trunks uh, standing in the tank. Um, and uh, uh, NASA decided to decommission this tank uh, three or four years ago, and uh, we began a negotiation process that took a long time. But uh, we finally found a way that uh, NASA could donate it to the University of Washington. And we raised some funds at UW to then install it in the UW uh, Harris Hydraulics Laboratory here. And that was just completed in the uh, spring of 2016. And you can see it here in, in its new home. Uh, this is a schematic of it. Um, it has wind, wave, and current um, mechanical wind, wave, and current uh, generation capabilities of reversible current, so you can look at wind against waves. It is also a unique facility because in addition to um, being able to change control of water temperature, we installed uh, some years ago a heat exchanger in the um, recirculation of the air so we're able to control the air temperature as well as the relative humidity, which allows us to do investigations as a function of, um, of the heat flux conditions. Um, so. Um, I'm hoping it'll make through the review process this time, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of you might be the re uh, reviewing these proposals since I listed a number of you as my uh, 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 suggested reviewers. Uh, and if I haven't convinced you here completely that it's a worthwhile thing to do, I would uh, draw on a line from Ken that I uh, recall hearing him use 10 or 15 years ago at a uh, ONR planning meeting when he was trying to sell a high risk, uh, high payoff project and that was, it would be a shame not to try. <laughs> so Ken, um, congratulations on your laudable and um, enduring career achievements and uh, best wishes on your 70th birthday and many happy returns of the day. Actually, I, I should say that from, um, you know, from work that uh, Dyko has been doing recently. Um, I think the 
opportunity to have a, a more uh, quantitative uh, use of this sort of work that Andy has just been talking about uh, will probably come to much better fruition than the classical um, white cap coverage has done in the past. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic about you know, what, what can happen in this area. So any questions?